thank you all so much uh, and a very warm welcome uh, to everyone for this uh, webinar. Uh, today we are joined by a very eminent uh, guest uh, who has been very instrumental uh, banker uh, uh, in the space of uh, Africa, Middle East, as well as India. Uh, he is Mr. R. Shankar, uh, who will present exclusively on this topic of uh, banking and uh, finance. Uh, so just to give a short introduction as to uh, Shankar's uh, journey in the field of uh, finance and uh, banking. He's a very accomplished uh, commercial banker. He's a finance professional, and he's also a C-suit uh, management uh, advisor. And uh, he has demonstrated close to around three decades of diverse experience with very leading international banks. He started off with uh, Standard Chartered Bank, then uh, Tech Mahindra uh, in uh, India, representing their BFSI uh, division. And thereafter, he moved on to Africa, Middle East. Uh, are typically taking care of larger uh, portfolios. So uh, most of the portfolios are typically in the assets, liabilities, operations, technology, audit, compliance, and risk management uh, space. Some of his key skills, uh, I would like to say here, which uh, really deserve uh, mention, have been in the business operations uh, space uh, with regards to technology initiatives, uh, the change management uh, uh, principles in the banking uh, industry, combining processes, combining systems, people, effective control and superior customer experience, and many uh, consulting assignments that he has done, uh, typically on fundraising, as well as uh, organizational restructuring, mergers and acquisition and integration. And along with this, um, uh, the list goes endless. I would also like to say that he has been into a lot of uh, he is a member of a lot of, uh, you know, conglomerates in terms of uh, banking conglomerates like the MCBI, which is the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Scotland, UK. He is also associate member of CAIIB, the Indian Institute of Bankers, as well as the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, which is the government of India, as well as ACFM, which is the Council of Financial Management uh, from Calcutta. So without much ado, I would like to hand over the floor uh, to uh, Mr. Shankar. Uh, to guide us and walk us through uh, some of the you know basics of uh, banking industry, which all of us may not be conversant, some of the uh, internal intricacies in the banking industry, and also touching upon other larger uh, evolving uh, trends. So we will talk more about evolution as well as you know the late uh, revolution that has taken place in the banking industry. I'm sure only this webinar will not be enough or sufficient. Uh, but he has kindly accepted to be a part of a sequel of webinars for us uh, over a period of time. And I'm sure we'll learn a lot uh, from him. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. R. Shankar, for taking time out uh, to be a, you know eminent speaker for our this uh, session. I leave the floor open to you. Over to you, Mr. R. Shankar, and request you to just turn on your video. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rajiv, uh, for the brilliant video and the nice introduction. And uh, at the outset, I just want to confirm whether I'm audible, loud and clear to everyone in the audience and whether my video is also visible. Yeah, Shankar, uh, you are visible. At the same time, you are uh, loud and clear. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Thank please. You. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. Yeah. Uh, so greetings, everyone. Uh, uh, I would like to keep this uh, entire webinar short and simple because uh, this is just an introduction, as Mr. Rajiv said. Uh, and to begin with, uh, I would like to extend my wholehearted thanks to the entire School of Management of Pimpri Chinchwad University, uh, led by Dr. Rajesh Sharma, uh, uh, the HOD, and also uh, the professor in practice, Mr. Rajiv Roy Chaudhary, and the marketing team led by Ms. Sharon, and so many others who might be uh, working in the background uh, to make this webinar a success. So usually this happens with the vote of thanks, but I thought to extend my thanks at the beginning itself for the wonderful support that the, the entire team has extended, uh, even before the commencement of this webinar. So, uh, so just to begin my webinar, uh, See, uh, I would like to initially take the first uh, two to three minutes to briefly take you through the flow of what exactly we are going to discuss or what exactly we are going to see going forward uh, in the next 50 minutes or so. Uh, uh, post that, once that ends, uh, at the end, I request the audience and, and the participants 
to keep some brief questions which are just relevant and specific to the context for the sake of time. So I would typically expect about four to five questions in a time frame of about 10 to 15 minutes max. And that too at the conclusion of the conversation. All right. So uh, this is what the flow is. So uh, now coming into the subject matter per se, uh, as the name suggests, uh, this webinar is all about how the banking, financial services and insurance sector has evolved globally and more specifically in the Indian context because this will largely give a flavor of how the BFSI space. So BFSI is basically banking, financial services, insurance. It's all clubbed together. So which we collectively call it as the BFSI. So this sector is basically the financial services sector that controls each and every country's economy, not just in India. Okay. So, uh, so, so we are going to see how the banking sector has evolved initially in India. And then we'll also take it global just to give you a feel of how uh, the BFSI space is there in other parts of the globe as well, beyond the shores of India. So this, uh, this would be the typical flow. And last but not the least, I have also prepared a short presentation, uh, which will be helpful for you to understand the various activities within the BFSI sector in, in terms of what each and every entity does in terms of uh, going through the day-to-day -day activities, in terms of attending their routine tasks and business operations. So this is what it is. So quickly going into the topic itself. So basically, uh, the banking sector in India uh, can be divided into three major phases. So uh, for the sake of understanding, uh, I would uh, classify this into the uh, period before independence. Okay, So that actually is the period from the 1800s to uh, up to the point when India became independent, which is 1947. Okay, Now, that is a phase one. The phase two will be from the point when the banks got nationalized. So, th so the reason why I took a cutoff at the year 1969 is, uh, 1969 is the year when the banks were nationalized. So that was a major turning point in the banking space uh, in the context of the Indian economy. So from 1969 to 1991 uh, is the phase two, which is the post-nationalization era. And from 1991 onwards is the phase of liberalization, which is phase three. So these three broadly are the phases which the country saw since uh, the pre-independence days, post-independence period, then uh, uh, from the phase of liberalization and beyond. So these three are the broad three phases. Now, Going into the phase one for the sake of some bit of uh, uh, winding ourselves into the past. Now, uh, the legacy in Indian economy goes back to the days of banking. So the formal banking sector was introduced in India by the East India Company. And when I say East India Company, is nothing but, but the British rule. Okay, so the British rule introduced the concept of uh, banking in India. And before that, it would have been the typical uh, indigenous uh, financial services and the banking sector, which was not regulated by any central bank, which was not regulated by any authority uh, of the government. So it will be largely uh, like private money lenders. It could be uh, personal, interpersonal lending and so on and so forth. Okay. But from the 1800 onwards is when uh, the East India Company decided to set up uh, three major uh, presidency banks. When I say presidency banks, it was set up by the British presidency, which is the East India Company. Now, there were three major presidency banks that were set up in different parts of India. First to come up in the 1800s, early 1800s, was the Bank of Calcutta, uh, which was set up in the year 1806. Now, after that, two presidency banks were set up in quick succession uh, between the 1830s and the 1840s, which is the Bank of Bombay in Mumbai, and the Bank of uh, Madras in Chennai. Okay, so these three are the major three presidency banks established by the East India Company during the British rule, and which created the platform for setting up the banking sector and how 
we see the banking sector as of today. So we'll see that entire journey. Now, from the 1800s up to the early 1900s, we saw all the three presidency banks individually operating in all the three major geographies. Okay, This is basically the East, the West, and the South. Okay, uh, Having said that, when all those three presidency banks were set up, there was no real regulatory control as at that point of time. And when I say regulatory control, the banking regulator, as we know in India, is the Reserve Bank of India, which came into existence only from the year 1935. Now, before that, it was the government which was actually regulating the banks under the British rule. Okay. Now, when those three presidency banks were controlling the crux of the banking transactions uh, in the country, now, in the early 1900s, it was felt that all the three presidency banks need to come together to form a larger bank. So, which is why the Bank of Calcutta, the Bank of Bombay, and the Bank of Madras were amalgamated or merged to form the Imperial Bank of India in the year 1921. And the Imperial Bank of India was the cornerstone of banking because the Imperial Bank of India, the same Imperial Bank of India, is the bank which got metamorphosized as the State Bank of India, which is SBI of today. Okay, So the Imperial Bank of India uh, in 1921 was set up by way of merging all the three presidency banks that I talked about. Okay, So all the three banks were merged and the Imperial Bank of India was formed. From 19... So this was the second stage of reforms. After the first stage of reforms, the presidency banks were set up. Now, when all the three uh, banks came together and the Imperial Bank of India came into existence is when uh, uh, request everyone to go on mute please, Pratibha. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so when all the three banks were merged to form the Imperial Bank of India from the year 1921 up to the year of 1954 or rather middle of 1955, the Imperial Bank of India was the, the major bank. And parallelly the, in the Indian economy, there were different business groups operating in different parts of India. So all the nationalized banks that we see of today, okay, like for example, Punjab National Bank, Bank of Baroda, Canara Bank, Allahabad Bank, Indian Bank, so many banks are, that we know of in the public sector, which is nationalized banks that we call, okay. All these banks came into existence from the end of 1800s to the early 1900s, most of these banks, barring few like Yuko Bank and those banks which came towards the early 1940s and so on. Okay, but most banks in the Indian context, because at that point of time, there was no regulatory structure that business groups cannot be owning banks. So at that point of time, there were business groups which were showing eagerness to set up their banks of their own. For example, uh, Central Bank of India belonged to the Tatas, the Oriental Bank of Commerce belonged to the Thapar Group, uh, 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 Yuko Bank was set up by uh, the Birla family and likewise Bank of Baroda was uh, uh, set up by the Maharaja of Gwalior. Kandra Bank was uh, set up by the Shetties of uh, Bangalore and so on and so forth. The list is endless. Okay, So those banks also came into existence and Allahabad Bank was one of the earliest joint stock banks. It, it had a very unique positioning uh, in the sense that it also had British shareholding as well as Indian shareholding by virtue of different banks getting merged into that bank. Okay, But all these banks started working independently along with the Imperial Bank of India and when the Reserve Bank of India, when RBI was set up as the regulatory bank or the central bank of the country in the year 1935, all these banks, including the Imperial Bank of India, came under the fold of RBI in terms of regulatory monitoring. When that happened, However, since the Imperial Bank of India existed much before that, the Imperial Bank of India did a lot of uh, kind of, I, I would say, kind of formative work uh, in setting up of the Reserve Bank of India. So, which is why uh, in terms of the hierarchy, uh, even today, like SBI commands the second uh, position uh, immediately after the RBI. For example, if SBI says something, even today, it's RBI Years with full ears and eyes, actually, completely. Because they know that if SBI is saying something, it has a real meaning to it. 
Okay, so that is the kind of uh, respect even now that SBI commands. Having said that, when RBI started its own uh, independent regulatory monitoring and uh, and the central banking activity, even Imperial Bank of India was also kind of nudged to follow what the regulator says, right? So that's how the banking sector evolved. And when the banks were operating independently up to the year 1969, uh, the banks that I said, the list which was set up by the Indian business groups were also under the private sector as at that point of time, until the year 1969, when there was a radical decision by Mrs. Gandhi as the prime minister in the year 1969, uh, uh, in the month of July. So July 1969 is when Mrs. Gandhi decided to nationalize all the banks that were hitherto operating in the private sector. And she decided to bring it under government control, which is when the the Banking Entities Transfer of Undertakings Act was passed in the year 1969, and all the banks were nationalized. So on 14th of July, 1969 is when uh, uh, 14 key banks were nationalized. And there was a second round of nationalization in the year 1980, uh, which, which saw the nationalization of six more banks. So between the years 1969 and 1980, uh, we saw 20 banks getting nationalized. Uh, and when I say nationalized, it is the government taking over the control and management of the banks. So that is called as uh, typically called as nationalization. Now, coming to the point of why the banks were nationalized, it, it had a hidden agenda to it. Mrs. Gandhi did not take a, a major decision because at that point of time, fresh out of independence, when the country needed real capital and growth uh, in terms of extending financial inclusion to different nooks and corners of the country. So the banking sector had to go into the villages, into the small towns and villages and all that. And that could be done only with the help of government support and the funds of the government getting pulled into it. And that also also had a connected uh, reason because uh, with a country of such a high population, people had to be fed because there were several, even in the 1800s and the 1900s, the country saw several bouts of famine, drought and all that. So Mrs. Gandhi wanted to uh, implement the Green Revolution. So uh, now from the Green Revolution onwards is when the country started real focus towards the agricultural sector. Now I'll tell you what Green uh, Revolution is all about. Till that point of time, the farmers were not getting easy or affordable credit from the banks because the cost of funding was very high. And the farmers uh, being below the poverty line and all that, they could not afford the high interest rates being charged by the bank. So nationalization in one single stroke uh, uh, gave rise to many solutions. A, the farmers got easy access to credit. Two, uh, uh, since the branches started operating in the villages, the farmers had very easy access to banking facilities in terms of uh, uh, giving their jewelry or giving their cattle uh, as collateral, taking loans, plowing it back to agriculture. Now, from the agriculture, whatever output they had, they sold it and they again uh, brought it back into the banking sector, the form of repaying the loans. So it's an entire cycle that got enabled by the Green Revolution, okay? Now, as part of the Green Revolution, as part of the thrust on agriculture, uh, it, it saw the nationalized banks setting up several Grameen banks, okay? So Grameen banks are typically the banks uh, which operate in the villages, actually, okay? Now, these banks uh, would actually be, would would see operating it under the uh, under the lead bank. So there was a scheme brought by the Nationalist Bank under the uh, ages of the government. It was called as the lead bank scheme, where uh, every nationalized bank in the country was given the responsibility to, to operate about two or three or four uh, uh, regional rural banks in the villages. Okay, So that the access to credit is accelerated and it's made really fast and the farmers are able to focus fully on agriculture to uh, increase the agricultural output and all that. So that was the entire purpose of that. Now, in the course of doing that, in the post-nationalization days, it was not bereft of challenges. There were a lot of challenges because when it came into the government control, all the banks saw sudden uprising in labor problems. 
the unions uh, in in every bank or in the sector as a whole uh, gathering together and raising their ugly heads to to raise the salaries to to provide better working conditions and all that so those were the own it came with its own set of challenges but uh, it realized the purpose of uh, giving a thrust to the to the agricultural sector uh, so much so that uh, by the early, by the late seventies or the early eighties, the government felt that there has to be a separate bank to be set up for the for the agricultural sector, and this bank will take over many activities uh, of agriculture, which was hitherto managed by all the other big banks like SBI or or the Reserve Bank of India. Okay, so this entity is is called as a NABARD, N A B A R D, which was called as National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, which was set up in the year nineteen eighty two. Okay. Uh, parallelly, the country also saw the setting up of the Exim Bank. So Exim Bank is basically the Export Import Bank of India. So that if there are any uh, kind of uh, excess production of output in terms of agriculture or commodities or any other activities like iron and steel, iron ore, whichever commodity you name it, right? Coal, like whichever commodity that could be exported, uh, the Export Import Bank of India acted as the Lead nodal bank to facilitate export import. Okay, so uh, so this Exim Bank, which is Export Import Bank of India, was initially set up as the uh, as a wing of the Reserve Bank of India initially, and it it became autonomous also in the year 1982. Okay, and parallelly, all the other development financial institutions which were set up in the 60s and 70s, like the Industrial Development Bank of India, which is IDBI, the Industrial Credit and Investment Corporation of India, which is ICICI. Uh, you had also uh, Industrial Finance Corporation of India, which was IFCI, and Unit Trust of India. All these development financial institutions were set up with the single objective of giving a thrust to the uh, to the economy as a whole, be it from the agriculture uh, uh, perspective or be it from the manufacturing perspective, uh, uh, lending it to the corporates or the industry and all of that. Okay. Now, this was the uh, period between 1969 to 1991, which is phase two. Now, now phase two also saw the, especially after the mid 80s, uh, it was there was a dire need felt to computerize all the branches. So the computerization of all the public sector banks also commenced in a small way. All right. So when the computerization started, it was initially the computerization at the branch level, where all the manual ledgers were initially converted into uh branch level ledgers uh in the core banking system but it was not a real core banking system those days in the real sense it was a branch server concept where the branch every branch used to handle its own transactions and carry out its own end of day processes and, and all of that so i will be covering all of these in subsequent sessions but the sake of understanding is computerization as a theme was picked up in the early 80s to progress further now Incidentally, when we move on to phase three in the year 1991, uh, which saw the country getting liberalized. Okay, so 1991 was the era of liberalization when both uh, Dr. P. V. Narasimha Rao as the prime minister and Dr. Manmohan Singh as the finance minister came together to liberalize the economy and uh, bring it uh, to bring the country out of the shackles of controlled regime. So. Uh, when you talk of liberalization is when all the multinational companies, the MNCs, started entering India in a big way. And also, more specifically to the banking sector, when a landmark decision was taken to set up the new generation private sector banks in the year 1991. So there were about 16 or 17 odd new generation private sector banks that came into existence, uh, which included the likes of today's banks like HDFC Bank, Axis Bank, which was then called as UTI Bank. There was IDBI Bank, there was Centurion Bank, there was Indusind Bank, there was Times Bank. So all these new generation banks came into existence at that point of time. Okay, so now 1991 onwards, when the rules were formulated for the new generation private sector banks to come into, uh, to get established in the country, it came with a huge, enormous thrust on computerization. Because by that point of time, most of the other nationalized banks operating in the country had moved over to major core banking platforms like Finical or FlexCube and, and the likes. However, 
when the new generation private sector banks were set up, the mandate given by RBI and the government, including the finance ministry, was to ensure that core banking platforms are set up from day one itself. So when it means day one, day one itself, the core banking platforms will be available. There will be anywhere banking in, in any bank, in any state, in any geography. So that was the mandate. So that happened with real thrust and it was a runaway success because the moment the new generation private sector banks uh, came into the economy, uh, there was a real pressure on the public sector banks to increase their efficiency levels, improve customer service, improve technology upgradations frequently and all of that. Because there was intense competition uh, 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 that started getting to heat up in the economy and it's, it started progressing. Now, 2000s and beyond is when, when we started the maturity phase, when the mergers and acquisitions activities started in quite a big way because it was felt that instead of operating as smaller individual banks, it is better that the size and scale is gained by merging two or three banks together and calling it as a big bank. So that was the whole idea. Now, having said that, uh, in parallel, there were many finance companies. There were eligible non-banking finance companies which made the cut. They were given licenses to either transform themselves into a bank or to apply for a separate banking license. So these happened. And parallelly, there were also microfinance companies, like for example, the latest example that can I can think of is Bandhan Bank. So Bandhan was one of the leading microfinance companies, which got a banking license. So when Bandhan Bank was set up, Bandhan as the microfinance company got a ready customer base of uh, clients who are willing to become banking clients under the umbrella of Bandhan Bank. So that in a way, also contributed a lot to the economy. So this is where we are in terms of the banking evolution in this country. And today we see lots of technology initiatives happening. And now, like beyond just the banking and the non-banking space, we have a lot of uh, thrust on the different subsectors within BFSA, like for example, FinTech. So when we talk about FinTech, uh, we realize that there are lots of subsidiary entities under the umbrella of FinTech. So fintech is a very broad connotation, but under the fintech umbrella, you have the payment intermediaries, you have the you have the payment gateway providers, you have uh, uh, the finance companies who are also operating money exchange companies as well, like the Muthuts or the Manapurams of the world. Okay, so there are lots of subcategories. Even in the banking space, also 2016 and 2017 and beyond. We have several new categories in the banking space. Like, for example, there's a separate category called Payments Bank. For example, you must be seeing that Atel is operating a bank called Atel Payments Bank. Then you would have seen there are lots of small finance banks. For example, Unity Small Finance Bank, Jana Small Finance Bank. You have uh, AU Small Finance Bank. So all these new categories of banks came into existence with a specific mandate of either to operate as a payments bank or to provide funding for the small and medium enterprises, which is basically the SME sector. So that was the whole idea. So the so the idea of setting up a, of an SFB or a payments bank is not to uh, is not to enable lending to the large corporates. It's only with a specific focus on the uh, small and medium enterprises because they are typically the excluded category because of certain strict criteria put up by the usual banks. Uh, they are not able to get for access to funding easily. So that is the entire purpose of that. So this is a broad overview that I thought I would give you people in terms of how the uh, banking sector has evolved. In parallel, uh, even on the financial services space also, a lot of uh, regulatory interventions have happened in terms of reigning in the non-banking finance companies because like in the 90s and 2000s, 2000s early 2000s, uh, it saw uh, the, there were lots of problematic issues coming up in terms of managing the finance company. Okay, So the finance companies uh, were brought under the strict control of the uh, of the Reserve Bank of India directly uh, under, the, uh, under the Department of Non-Banking Supervision. So basically, in Reserve Bank of India, there are two umbrellas. 
there is a department of banking supervision which takes care of banks monitoring and uh, compliance and uh, uh, and guidance and there is also a separate department called department of department of non banking supervision which takes care of the monitoring and compliance of the finance companies but over the last couple of years uh, uh, since the gap between a finance company and a bank has narrowed considerably uh, the government decided to merge both the Department of Banking Supervision and the Department of Non-Banking Supervision. Now it is called as a single Department of Supervision in RBI, which controls both the banks as well as the finance companies. So that's how it has happened. So this is where we are in terms of that. And in terms of housing finance companies, companies which are not banks, but are lending specifically for housing finance purposes, like for example, a LIC housing finance or a BOB housing finance or a PNB housing finance, they are all under the regulatory watch uh, uh, of the uh, of the National Housing Bank. So the National Housing Bank or the NHB is a regulator only to monitor and control the activities of the housing finance companies. Okay, so this is what the broad regulatory framework is. Now coming to the insurance space, insurance also did not see a formal regulator till the uh, till the early nineties when the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority was set up. Because uh, until that point of time, it was the entirely the uh, public sector which was controlling the insurance. For example, in the life insurance space, uh, it was LIC that was controlling the life insurance space as a monopoly. And in, in the general insurance space, which is basically the non-life space, it was uh, basically the General Insurance Corporation of India, which was uh, acting as a kind of a quasi-regulator for, for the individual public sector insurance companies. Like, for example, the New India Assurance, the national insurance, the Oriental insurance, and the and the United India insurance. So these four public sector companies were uh, being monitored by the General Insurance Corporation of India until the point when the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India was set up, which is IRDAI. So IRDAI is the uh, is the regulator for the insurance industry, and today IRDAI controls both the life as well as the non-life space of the insurance sector in India. Okay, so uh, this is what is the uh, crux of the, uh, uh, how the banking, financial services and insurance space has evolved. Now, I will quickly take, uh, uh, take the opportunity of uh, sharing with you a presentation, uh, which will actually detail the activities of that. So, I mean, I will briefly run through the activities in terms of how the structure has happened. Okay. Uh, so just hold on for a minute, please. Sure, Shankar. Is my screen visible? Uh, no, not yet, uh, Mr. Shankar. Okay. I think there's a network glitch because it's uh, it's a bit slow, Rajiv. I mean, if you're able to share the thing from your side, uh, the presentation, if you don't mind. Yeah, let me just check. Just a sec. Yeah, is it uh, visible now? Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Rajiv. Yeah, no worries. Please go ahead. Yeah. So let's go to slide number one. I think there's a... I mean, it's visible 50-50, yeah. So let's go to the cover slide. I mean, uh, we'll start from the cover slide itself. So that the audience are able to appreciate the... Is it fine now? I've just uh, zoomed it. Yeah, so but you need to just still go up actually. You need to scroll up a bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just keep scrolling up to the cover slide. Okay. Is this fine yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, fine. yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, so this, ladies and gentlemen, is the uh, crux of the presentation where we are going to see 
uh, we have already talked about the evolution to the revolution part. And we will also talk about the activities uh, that are contained in the respective uh, uh, sectors, uh, namely banking, financial services, and insurance. Yeah, just move on, uh, Rajiv, to the next slide. Now, we have a very interesting quote, yeah? So this quote says, your best quote that reflects your approach. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Okay, so this is a very famous quote of the famous astronaut Neil Armstrong. Okay, so this broadly relates to the cover slide. If you go back a bit, uh, <clears throat> now you can see how the banking sector. So if you see the top part of the uh, uh, of the staircase row, the row of the staircase in the picture, this actually. Uh, so just beyond the banister, you can see a kind of a wavy thing. So this actually defines how the banking sector has evolved in the country. Like, for example, it has taken a leap. Then it has come down because there were lots of bank failures and all that. Now, going up is when the country saw lots of regulatory interventions and all of that. Now, it got flattened out because after nationalization is when there was a long thrust. <laughs> you are able to see my cursor. I'm just moving my cursor. This is the long thrust when the economy was in the midst of nation building, actually. <clears throat> right after independence up to the early 80s. And then after the liberalization happened in 91, is saw the complete leap, actually, to the next level. Now, this is for the man. So what Neil Armstrong essentially says is for a man, uh, it's a small step. So the man tries to take a kind of a one step at a time approach. Okay. But when the economy grows, it's a giant leap for the entire mankind, actually. So I hope I'm able to explain myself clearly on what this depicts, actually. And uh, just move on. So yeah. the famous quote of Neil Armstrong. Now, now, this, now moving on to the global ecosystem within the banking, financial services, and insurance space. Now, wherever you go, now it's not just within India. If you go to India or any part of the globe, it could be Middle East, it could be Africa, it could be Asia Pacific, it could be Australia, New Zealand, whichever geo you talk about, you will see broadly these categories of institutions, which are basically banks, which are basically typically commercial banks. Because when you say banks, banks have two kinds of banks. You have commercial banks, you also have investment banks. So commercial banks are the banks which are typically the banks which handle the public transactions, uh, public banking transactions. Like, for example, accepting deposits from the public, uh, then lending money for either investment or for uh, uh, making a profit. So basically the aspect of uh, taking deposits and lending of, uh, lending of money. Right, So that is the brief of the commercial bank. Now, you also have another category of bank called investment bank. So investment bank is nothing to do with commercial banking. Investment banks are typically banks which help other corporates raise funds. Uh, uh, they also handle the aspect of mergers and acquisitions. They undertake due diligence. They act as advisors to corporates and so on and so forth. Now, so broadly, everything comes under the umbrella of banks. Now, the next category is NBFCs. So, NBFCs are the non-banking finance companies. So, to give you an example of non-banking finance company, Bajaj FinServ is the largest NBFC now, as I can think of in India. Okay. So, uh, so Bajaj FinServ is not a bank. So, it's a non-banking finance company. Mahindra Finance is not a bank. It's a finance company. Okay. Sriram Transport Finance is a finance company. It's not a bank. So these are the non-banking finance companies. They are non-banks, but they are, they are a finance company. They are undertaking lending. They are accepting deposits and so on and so forth. Now, financial institu institutions is what I explained, uh, which hardly exists now because uh, over a period of time, every financial institution like, like say, for example, an IDBI or a IFCI or ICICI or a UTI or an HDFC have converted themselves from a development financial institution into a universal bank. And the latest financial institution that got merged into the bank that it helped set up is the IDFC bank. Okay, which was set up by IDFC and 
now idfc has has been merged into idfc first bank okay so that is the financial institution now insurance as i told you is either a life insurance company or a non life insurance company both under the private sector as well as under the public sector now next is fintech is what i explained it could be a payment service provider it could be a payment gateway it could be a it could be a kind of a mobile app or an aggregator and so on and so forth next is remittances and payments so remittances and payments companies are typically the companies which accept foreign currencies from the public they convert and remit it to the country or to the currency of their choice next is a financial intermediary financial intermediary is a uh, entity which acts as a conduit between a bank and a finance company and a finance company and an insurance company and so on and so forth they will act as a gateway or whatever but the intermediation efforts are common so in many ways then one financial intermediary also acts as a fintech as well so there's a kind of an overlap now microfinance company is a company that typically is a finance company in some way but it undertakes uh, uh lending of micro loans as part of achieving financial inclusion so that is achieved through through the sector of the microfinance companies and the microfinance companies ensures that uh whichever classes of borrowers are are excluded by the formal system they ensure that uh, those categories of uh, lesser privileged uh, strata or the sections of the society uh, have access to loans at cheaper rates so that is the purpose of the microfinance company like for example as i told you bandhan was a microfinance company in india so these are broadly the various structural aspects of the of the uh, of the banking and financial services and insurance space and this has its uh, uh has its spread globally in whichever country you go to next slide please now this broadly defines so the foregoing the ongoing slides we will actually see the different activities as i told you earlier this is only for broad understanding there might be several activities which might not find mention here but please do not treat it that this is an exhaustive slide this this is just for the basic bare understanding uh, in terms of what a bank does or what kind of activities a bank does it is just for reading and you can go through and whoever is in need of the presentation can also get in touch with professor rajiv would be very happy to share it with you okay so like for example you have different categories like customer and account on onboarding which involves uh, like account opening loan account opening uh, savings account opening uh, acquiring new customers and all that payments processing is typically most are automated in today's context because most happen through the stp mode stp is basically the straight through processing where there is no manual intervention everything happens in a jiffy like through upi through imps and all those channels like uh, like how the national payments corporation of india which is npci this is acting as the uh, thrust for digital india now now you have loan origination like creating loans doing uh, preparing documentation for loans doing credit underwriting ascertaining the eligibility and so on you have kyc processing verification validation Uh, getting hold of the customer's ID proof, address proof, and all that. Then you have the statutory compliance, uh, more specifically from a HR and a labor perspective, like uh, maintaining adherence to labor laws, uh, giving the salaries on time, processing of incentives, doing settlements, uh, ensuring settlements of employees who do who leave the organization. You have debt collection. Debt collection involves uh, co collecting back the loans. and doing the recoveries in terms of borrowers who have not paid back the loans then you have the legal process some bit of it is outsourced uh, quite a bit of it is still in house they do the document management they review the agreements contracts and so on and so forth customer service is simple i mean uh, customer service is is the front end operations of any bank or a finance company you just enter into a bank or finance company you are greeted by the customer service team who is sitting and of course the sales that keep happening through the sales team okay so these broadly some of the activities in a bank now moving on to the next slide
yeah so this is broadly the same but it's rearranged to depict the activities for a non banking finance company so nothing much to talk about beyond what is already talk, talked about right now we move into the insurance sector now moving on to the insurance sector you have some activities are common like for example kyc the account opening loan processing because even an insurance company gives loan against its policies it processes the claims which is the most important aspect of a insurance company because we take insurance for our life or for our car or for our house all the insurance policies that policies that we typically take are for coverage of risk in whatever form could be the coverage of our own life risk could be the coverage of risk for a motor vehicle could be for a house and so on and so forth so if there's an unfortunate claims incident the claims processing is a very important aspect and that defines the customer service and and repeat attraction of the of the customers towards an insurance company the other is lapse session management when, when when in an existing policy the premiums are not paid a policy lapses okay how how through the lapse session management process the expired policies are revived so that is handled through this process health check management if it's a health insurance company definitely for many critical covers and all that there is a question of health checkups and all that and hospital network management is for basically the cashless claims and all that premium collections customer service and sales move on please this is this defines the activities of a non life insurance company which are broadly the same but a non life insurance company has the extra element of surveyorship for example if there is a fire tragedy or a, or a, or an accident happening the insurance the, the non life insurance company will not settle the claim just like that it will appoint a surveyor who is on the panel of the insurance company to visit the site do a survey investigate as to why the incident happened and so on and so forth then the aspect of underwriting as well in terms of what are the risk elements and the risk quotient happening for example uh, in the health insurance space when the covid pandemic happened the the pandemic saw the premiums getting enhanced by a uh, sizable margin during the next immediate renewal because because of the health health insurance uh, policies uh coming into play for hospitalization of covid patients and all of that right so uh so all these happens through that underwriting process then you have the normal premium collections customer service and product sales so these are the broadly the activities of a non life company move on please right now this defines the activities of a fintech and a micro finance company broadly the same it's a mix and match of a non banking finance company and a bank the only other aspect is when when the receivables or the or the outstanding recoveries go goes beyond a certain level uh uh banks have the option to move those stressed assets to an asset free construction company which is the arc okay and uh, even the contract management also because the contract management and documentation for a fintech and microfinance company assumes a lot of importance because there are multiple stakeholders both internal and external so it's very important to define the roles and responsibilities of the various stakeholders involved in the chain of uh in the chain of activities yeah next slide please this is the activity in a typical remittance and a financial intermediary how the payments processing happen because remittance is all about payments how the correspondent banks are involved how the uh, the money is stuck with a particular uh country or with a particular uh geography be due to regulatory issues it could be due to operations issues it could be to, uh, related to country risk issues and so on and so forth so uh, all these are handled through the payments processing engine of the remittances or the financial intermediary with due respect to the, the local laws of the respective countries so all these are broadly common and this has got nothing to do with the indian context these are all applicable globally next slide please that's it and 
this basically sums up how the financial side of the economy evolves in in every country globally now this ends the presentation but i'll quickly take some 5 to 7 minutes of time having discussed all of that in length in the last about 45 50 minutes uh what i would typically uh, like to take you on and this is got nothing to do with the presentation is about the skills that are needed so whoever so i'm sure the audience will have a mix of freshers it could be aspiring students it could be people who are about to get graduated and uh, to move on to the next level of the career progression and so on and so forth but one common uh, few common points that i would like to uh, indicate during this webinar is like the skill sets and the uh, qualities mm -hmm. that you need to develop for making a career in the banking financial services and insurance space and most of it is are common now to start off with the soft skills right you, you should need exemplary communication skills so for example mm -hmm. you should need convincing abilities you should be able to put your point across uh, to the other side of the table uh, uh, you must be a good uh, you, you you must have good convincing abilities of uh, mm -hmm. handling customer grievances how to convert a dissatisfied customer into a satisfied customer so that when he comes with a grudge and when he walks out of the office he walks out as a happy customer not as a disgruntled customer so th these can come out only with all these kinds of soft skills like communication skills listening abilities you need to be a very good listener if you uh, start cutting across people and do not allow the other party to speak uh, mm -hmm. then uh, the other party will get demotivated right so you must allow the other party to speak in terms of being a good listener and after taking their permission and if they are done you can start putting your point across of uh, what the points are or what uh, needs to be factored in and all of that so uh, that is one thing and now coming on to the uh, career side of the progression uh, if you want to progress on the corporate side of life be it a bank or a finance company or or on the corporate side of things you need to be a good leader okay you should be able to lead forward you should be able to lead a team because ultimately it's not a single person handling an entire bank it's a team at various points at various locations that makes the organization successful right so you need to be a very strong leader you should be able to take your team along with you your team should respect your own abilities as a leader right so the leadership qualities as you significant importance or rather the single most important point or the single most important quality of of a leader so the leadership qualities are very important and of course i mean if you are in the space of the financial services and banking and uh, and the insurance space you should develop an eye for detail you should have abilities to minutely capture the smallest of details minutely you should be in a position to capture errors or inconsistencies and so on and so forth so that a you are able to protect the risk of your employer in terms of incurring huge financial losses though there will be checks and balances in place and however if you are able to identify and uh, control and manage the risk at your own level i'm sure the employer or the bank or the finance company where you are employed will give you accolades and they will appreciate your uh, uh, your uh, skills and all of that so you should need to develop all those kinds of skill sets okay so this broadly summarizes the end of the presentation and uh, i would now leave the floor open for a few logical questions not more yeah, than so five. just thank you so me. much uh, mr r shankar uh, uh there is one question from professor ankush shrivastava uh, right. he's the lead uh, finance expert in our uh, school of management so right. i'll just uh, relay the question uh, uh, his question because he has some internet issues so Please. typically he is asking uh, that how a commercial bank uh, measures its risk and that to how it is managed in practice so if you could throw some light on that okay so now uh, typically what happens is uh, going back to the structure of a commercial bank okay so like any commercial bank is led by a chairman 
which is led by a managing director and a chief executive officer who is the executive leader in handling the day-to-day -day activities. So it's not the chairman, but the MD and CEO. But having said that, the MD and CEO is not the lone person who decides or all of that because from a corporate governance angle, there are different committees under the board of directors. Okay. So the board of directors have various committees. Okay. Like for example, uh, it has an audit committee of the board. It has a risk management committee. It has a CSR committee. It has a compensation committee and so on. Different kinds of committees which are specialized to handle issues of different nature. Okay. Now coming to this specific uh, question posed by <laughs> Professor Ankush Sharma. Uh, uh, so the risk management. Ankush committee, Srivastava, yeah, just to be Ankush, precise. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ankush it. Srivastava. So uh, this risk management committee of the commercial bank is uh, the committee that formulates the uh, risk management policies of the entire bank. And when it formulates the policies of the entire bank and presents it to the board of directors, once it's the risk management policies are uh, are approved by the board of directors. It is the responsibility of the executive management led by the MD and CEO to uh, spread the uh, policies and the details of the policies to all the branches and to all the officers, be it globally if it's a global bank or uh, if it's, an, uh, it's a bank within the country, to all the offices in different parts of the regions, be it north, south, east, west. Okay. Now, this risk management policy of the bank, which flows from the risk management committee. So there'll be risk management manuals. Okay. So there'll be operating manuals and every operating manual, whichever will have a risk management component, which will define how to undertake a particular activity or a task. So, so as to not go in contravention to the risk management policy of the bank. Okay. So the risk management policy could be in related to the credit operations. It could be related to the it could be related to information technology. It could be related uh, to corporate governance or any area. But the risk management committee is the most important crux of one of the major committees of a bank. I hope that answers the question in some way. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that's quite uh, in detail. Uh, so one question from my side, uh, Mr. Shankar. I just uh, wanted to know, like, what is the extent of uh, digitalization that has taken place? I mean, if you consider the Indian banks vis-a-vis -vis the uh, global banks, and to what extent do you think uh, India is ahead or lagging as far as uh, digitalization is concerned? Okay, uh, good question. And I would throw some numbers here. Uh, like, I would take you back to the uh, time when we saw the demonetization happening, right? In October, November of 2016, right? When the demonetization happened, the currency in circulation was sucked up by the RBI. Close to 90 to 95 percent of the currency was sucked up of circulation. Okay. Now, as a result of demonetization happening, what happened ultimately? There were no much, uh, I would say, digital payment modes uh, beyond the usual RTGS or NEFT or the or the INPS modes. But the larger population, the <laughs> the common man on the streets or the people in the villages who are so used to accustomed to doing cash transactions for the smallest of things, like going to a nearby shop or to going uh, uh, to purchase a loaf of bread or uh, like uh, uh, going to the market to buy some vegetables or something. Till that point of time, it was all kind of cash transactions happening, even as of 2016, right? People never knew what a digital transaction is all about. Now, today, in 2024, okay, seven or eight years down the line since demonetization, you have even a boot polisher or a, a fruits vendor or a vegetable vendor or even a, a sugarcane vendor on the street who has a QR code, right? Now, how that has got enabled? That has got enabled because of the government's vision to bring about a huge amount of inclusion. Now, from a, as low as a penetration of 16% on the digital side, India is now as high as 78%, uh, which is digitally included now as a country. So now you can imagine in the eight years, what kind of thrust the government has done in terms of various measures through entities like NPCI, the National Payments Corporation of India, which is the torch bearer of digital transactions now in terms of UPI, 
in terms of bringing in intermediaries like phone pay bringing in google pay paytm and so many uh, providers you have okay and most importantly the uh, the i would say it's a super hit in terms of uh, interoperability so that aspect is called interoperability for example uh, you have a account with google pay but you are not enrolled with phone pay right or you are not uh, enrolled with paytm absolutely no worries even if you have a google pay if you scan a yeah. qr code of a phone pay or a paytm the payment will still go through that is the aspect of interoperability basically where uh, the same payment even though it gets routed through different providers ultimately the source and destination is the same actually so the payment originates from the source and it goes to the destination even though there are change in providers in between actually in that entire group so uh, now india is almost 80% included now and nowhere in the world and india is the largest uh, digitally included economy in the uh, world now globally with 80% right, of fantastic Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. So, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Shankar. I think that does answer my question. I leave the floor open to any other questions uh, from the team and uh, beyond. Please go ahead. All right. So I think, uh, Mr. Shankar, uh, there are no further questions. But definitely, uh, uh, the presentation is there with me, and it's uh, quite a comprehensive uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. And you have spoken at length, uh, right, from the evolution uh, to the various uh, activities that have been happening in uh, in the BFSI uh, sector. Uh, and I'm sure there's more to it than what uh, meets the eye, which we can uh, uh, discuss uh, subsequently at length in the following. Uh, in the subsequent uh, iterations or the sequels uh, and we would be all ears to hear from you uh, so with this i'll just pass on um, uh, to the baton to uh, dr ajay sharma our honorable uh, hod uh, from the school of management uh, to conclude this uh, webinar for uh, mr shankar good afternoon mr shankar thank you so much dr sharma good afternoon mr shankar can you hear me Yes. Good afternoon. Your voice is very loud and clear. Very clear. Wow! Wow! Wonderful! Wonderful! So, before I formally propose, what of thanks to you, I would uh, be glad to extend my heartfelt thanks to my colleague, Mr. Rajiv, because of whom we could meet. Absolutely. Because uh, we could meet the stalwart like you, who is really. Amazing as far as banking, Indian banking system, and the entire you know journey right from the phase one to phase three, the entire insurance sector, the way you elaborated entire concept of banking really um, remember my entire history of you know Indian banking system. I so I'm really that. thankful to you and thankful uh, to you not only to you but to Mr. Rajiv and my entire team. who is always supporting me in the entire you know journey of this academics we are taking i had taking forward in my school so i'm not only thankful to mr rajiv i'm thankful to mr ankur srivastava who is a financial expert at our at our school rajkumar who is also a finance faculty with us professor aboli professor amit patel mr ajay mishra and not none of them this lady so called uh, seren who is a uh, art leader for digital marketing for happening these sort of sessions for us so i again extend my thanks to miss seren and her team proudly so thank far you, as uh, thank you so much yeah so so far as uh, you know this entire session is concerned which you discussed about right from phase 1 to phase 3 it was like you discussed about in phase 1 you know i had forgotten all the concept of indian banking system mr ravi but you really recalled me i am so thankful that i really do not have words to express my again you know many one many thanks to you so you you recall us about 1806 where presidency bank came into play right Right. in kolkata chennai mumbai 
then merger came into again play by the by these three banks imperial banks came in, came into picture in 1921 and now then you talked about phase 2 which took place from 18, 1969 to 1991 wherein all this nationalization of bank grain revolutions farmers got ex- easy access to credit agriculture output grameen bank again came into play in this phase and right from evolution to revolution you talked about right thank you so then in 1991 you again recalled us one of the finest you know parliamentary in of our country mr manmohan singh who was the instrumental in bringing up this lpg to our country and because of his policies perhaps we are one of the we are in the queue of becoming one of the largest economy in the world in this to come i have absolutely no apprehension in mind that yes one day we will be one of the largest economy in the world because we have a demographic dividend population dividend anyways so afterwards you talked about uh, uh, you talked about nationalization of bank right then global economic system global ecosystem rather amazing bfsi you talked about any nbfc you talked about you talked about activities in banks loans savings account everything right so you also talked about nbfc nbfcs activities in life insurance and no life life insurance companies then again fintech microfinance remittances and financial intermediaries and so nicely you handled both the questions thrown to you but really amazing i was mesmerized after hearing your you know electrician the way of style you speak amazing mr sankar i formally i formally from this forum invite you to be the part of my induction program which is likely to be held in the month of august where new entrants are inducted so you are cordially invited from my side formal invitation will be sent to you from our end so please do accept our invitation mr sankar Thank and you, i really express my heartfelt thanks obliged i'm really obliged and grateful for your such a wonderful session thank you thank you so much to you i'm really sort of words to express my thanks to you thank heartfelt you sir thank you thank you, thank you very much yeah dr sharma and thank you very yeah, thank much thank you so much dr ajay sharma thank you so much uh, mr r shankar i'm sure uh, this is just the beginning and we will have many more such sessions and many, many such eminent uh, dignitaries coming and you know actually sharing their experiences on the field with us and with this i'm sure uh, you know everyone be it faculty be it students be it the larger you know diaspora they will uh, grossly be benefited in terms of learning as well as in terms of uh, application thank you all once again and we'll all stay connected and thank you again, good thank day thank you to professor rajiv a uh, special note of thanks from my side uh, for bringing me into this forum and making this a very enjoyable session thank you rajiv absolutely ashankar the pleasure is equally mine thank you very much have a thank good